the history and evolution of visual arts is the appreciated imagery produced with the magic lantern at the Renaissance period. A device capable to capture light, bend it through lenses and transform it into images through a series of slides painted on crystal and projected onto a screen. Suspended images produced an amazing effect on the imagination of philosophers and scientists. The Magic Lantern also influenced generations of artists and it sets a precedent on the invention of the cinematograph. Athanasius Kircher attributes himself to the invention of the Magic Lantern in his book Ars Magna Lucis in Umbra. The book describes the camera obscura as well as another mechanism used for the visualization of images on a screen, similar to the Magic Lantern. Kircher was a German G-suit and a mathematics professor at the Roman College that, due to the wonders produced by his mechanisms, was said to perform black magic. He defended his work, explaining that the mechanisms weren't devilish, but rational applications of the magic secrets of nature. Among many other inventions, Kircher designed an artificial light of a parabolic shape used for reading at night. But in spite of Kirscher's contribution, it's attributed to the German academic Christian Huygens, who is known as the inventor of the Magic Lantern in 1659. He achieved a meticulous and detailed scientific knowledge, which allowed him to develop a device able to calculate accurately the angle of light bending and combine it with the perfectly sculpted lens. He created a series of slides, paintings on crystal, that would produce the effect of a moving image through a mechanical process. Concerned with the potential of his own invention, and to turn it away from its scientific purpose into a commercial distribution, Huygens thought of his invention as absurd, and he hid his authorship. In his book, Oculus Artificialis, Johann Zahn presents many descriptions, diagrams and illustrations of the camera obscura and the magic lantern. Zahn developed the magic lantern further, using it in anatomy conferences, and he suggested the projection of images on water, underlining the importance of hiding the device from the viewer. Some of his works were made with optical impressions colouring engravings. Also, the Italian painter Canaletto used the camera obscura for the realisation of his paintings of Venice. He called this instrument the Ottica camera. So the second part of this lesson is about the evolution of the Magic Lantern and the art of audiovisual live performances. One of the first known live visual performances was the Phantasmagoria, which took place at the end of the 18th century. And it was a pioneering show in the history of cinema and, and also live audiovisual performance. It's based on the creation of an immersive space with imagery of ghosts and death and other motives. Recreating a sense of another dimension, it produced fear and surprise on the audiences by using magic lanterns, smoke, screens and sound effects. As the magic lantern became more widely used in a number of different ways, its design also evolved. The oil lamp was replaced by an incandescent lamp, and later we saw the development of the voltaic arc, the biennial and the triennial magic lanterns. As it evolved, the magic lantern started to incorporate mechanisms which helped it spread its application into new areas. Around 1756, Jack Charles invented the megascope that augmented and projected images of any object directly. For the decade of 1770, Seraphine Francoise presented in Versailles with great success Ombres Chinoise, the magic lantern used in a shadow theatre. In 1789, the magic lantern took a politically relevant role when it was used to demonstrate how French aristocrats take advantage on commons. Later, in 1791, it was used with educational purposes during the court case of Mary Antoinette. Franz Anton Mesmer, 
famous for his work with animal magnetism, used the magic lantern during classes and hypnotism sessions. It was also used for healing purposes by Professor Jean-Martin Charcot in his treatment of epilepsy and hysteria. So back to what will later be called the Phantasmagoria. Etienne Gaspard Robison developed several of the features which made possible these performances to an extreme and unforgettable experience for the audience. Robertson created a version of the Magic Lantern which had adaptable lenses and also made it more portable, allowing to change the size of the projected image. The Belgian magician worked with several projectors and surfaces for projection, specifically made for rear projection and projecting onto gauze that produced a translucent appearance. In Berlin, during the year of 1780, one of the first Phantasmagoria shows scared the audience with a combination of saloon tricks, seance sessions and projection effects. The show would reach its peak with an explosion in the room of an exhibition. The room looked like it was burning into flames with the audience inside and the effect was conceived with the use of projections. These events were not very popular for a period of time, but he continued developing and improving it. A couple of years later it started a new performance concept in Vienna that toured for more than a year and arrived at Paris in 1793. This was around the time of the plan advance in the French Revolution, and the entrance of the event was through the Gothic surrounding cemetery. The show structure was designed and detailed on scripts and scenes. But Robertson also applied new effects, masks, ventriloquism, and projection of three-dimensional figures and actors. The show proved to be extremely realistic, and finally Robertson had to reveal its secrets as a result of a court trial. From this moment on, the show became very popular. In 1801, Paul of Philipstall presented in London his version of the Phantasmagoria. He did this at the Lyceum Theatre, and it was a very successful production. The term Phantasmagoria seemed to be coined in 1801 by Louis Sebastian Mercier, and it was the name that Philipstall used for the exhibition at London. Phantasma Agoria, the word, comes from two Greek words originally. Phantasma, meaning image, and Agoria, meaning assembly. The Phantasmagoria performances used zooming movements, camera movements, superimposition and dissolved imagery with a combination of stage machinery and screen design. Robertson continued his shows performing in Russia, Europe and then arriving in New York in May 1803 where the show became a form of public entertainment causing fascination to millions. In 1849, the Langheim brothers used the first photographic slides with the Phantasmagoria. These were called Hyaliotypes. They were shown off, first of all, in a great exhibition in London in 1851. While Phantasmagoria was evolving and amazing many audiences all over the world, Around 1730, another invention appeared, the color organ. This is a first device that combines motion, light, sound, and scientific studies about the audio and visual perception, anticipating the concept of synesthesia. A crucial development in the invention of the color organ was Isaac Newton's optics, a treatise of reflections, refractions, inflections, and colours of light. This book states a direct relationship between the seven colours and the seven unities of the audio scale. Following up from this theory and influenced by the work of Kircher and Delaporta, the g monk Louis Bertrand Castel proposed an instrument called the ocular harpsichord, a light organ that simultaneously produces sound and its associated colour. The ocular harpsichord is considered to be the first colour organ. 
The composer George Philip Telemann travelled to France to see the organ firsthand, and he was inspired to write several pieces for the colour organ and an edition of a book. Castell would build a second model of the instrument using chemical candles with refracting mirrors that allowed a brighter projection to be contemplated by a larger audience. Later in 1850, Alexandra Alice Rimington demonstrated that the colour spectrum should closely match a visual octave. Through observation with a prism, he divided the spectrum into 12 colours, one for each semitone of a C scale. Rimington performed at St James's Hall in London with a colour organ in 1895. The Russian composer Alexandra Skriabin amazed an auditorium in New York with the synesthetic symphony Prometheus, the Poem of Fire, and one year later he performed this in London with great success. The Danish musician Thomas Wilfred also developed the art of light and sound with his sculptures of light that he called Lumia. To perform Lumia, Thomas Wilfred created the machine, the Clavelux. The Clavelux delivered his compositions of light, colour and form, which slowly changed over time and delivered a broad spectrum of colour and shape. His first public appearance with the Clavelux, which was a modern ocular harpsichord, was in New York in 1922. Wilfred continued to tour his performance around the world over the years. And his Clavelux was also developed as a home use unit with a series of colored records and a TV style interface. People at home could also create their own Lumia. The ocular harpsichord was one of those marginal instruments that served science for a while and then disappeared, only to pop up again occasionally in subsequent history. It's during the 20th century that most of the artworks were done in visual music by artists from different areas.